Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11 today. I think it is the one of the half a dozen passages in Scripture you can't live without. Um, well, you can't live without any of it. I mean, I mean you can understood, but if all you were left with were a few passages, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11, that was the only chapter you had to go by, you'd be all set. And so, um, the rest of the scriptures all reinforce the same theme. But in this particular passage, Paul is, is really trying to explain to the Philippian people not to be concerned. And here's the reason why. We talked about it last week. Um, because whether I go or stay, it's okay. Whether I depart from you or go to heaven or whether I stay with you, it's all fine by me. And it's all according to God's will, so I'm good. So don't you be concerned. However, we understand, maybe in an immediate fashion today, when we pray for our June and find out that she's not doing quite tip-top shape that we used to see it in the gal. And uh, naturally our hearts go out with somewhat concerned, if not a lot concerned for her and Marlo. Um, and at the same time, we know that their destiny, like our own, is having bound with Christ. So whether they go or whether they stay, uh, and of course this is why Scripture teaches us other places that uh, we can mourn the loss of people emotionally and relationally, but we don't grieve like normal people. We grieve like people who uh, have a hope, and that's a wonderful thing. Now I'm not burying anybody this morning, that's not what I'm saying, but this is what Paul is saying. And it's very kind of timely. He says, whether I go or stay, it's okay. I win, no matter what. If I'm in God's will, I win. And so does God, if I'm obedient to what he calls me to. Let's read through this uh, first chapter. I'm using the NIV today simply because I'm more familiar with it in this version. It says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And here's how. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I just think that's one of the most profoundly stirring passages. I mean, there are many. But for me, that uh, Paul pulls out all the stops there. Uh, it seems like. Let's take a look at it a little bit more in depth. Um, John Piper, I put on the beginning of your outline, said, Jesus humbled himself to the point of death for you so that you would humble yourself for others, which I like. Or to put it another way, humility is God-conscious 
That's not your outline. And the opposite of humility, pride, is self-conscious. You've probably heard those expressions before. Um, he begins with a series of ifs. And it's interesting, these series of ifs. They're conditional. It's a conditional, long conditional sentence. Like, if you don't pick up your room, then your father's going to whoop you when he gets home. <laughs> if you don't eat your carrots, you'll be blind by 12. You know, those kind of if that conditions. You know, if you don't put oil in your car, you will ruin your engine. You know, there's conditional things. It's part of how we navigate through life. And Paul is helping them to navigate through life and through his situation and theirs. Remember, their lives are in many ways as much in peril as Paul's life. They may not be in that immediate danger as Paul is in chains and in bondage, but their uh, testimony as Christians within the Philippian culture is just as tenuous as any Christians anywhere, and they're likely to be persecuted, in fact will be, and uh, shunned by the general culture. And so uh, uh, it's important that he encourages them. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ. So in other words, what's the benefit of being united in Christ? And then he goes on to say that. If you have, if there's any benefit, if there are any perks, if there will, as you will, fruit of being united with Christ, these are the things you should think about. In other words, it's not just pie in the sky. You understand? He's, he's like, this isn't just, just some theology and doctrine out there in the middle of nowhere that comes down to you and you just have to memorize it. But this is very practical. This is how we live. And God's a real person, and we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and there are benefits from doing that. Benefits from having a relationship with Christ. And he's trying to encourage them to think of those terms. To remember, it's not just a matter of being persecuted. Uh, for example, in other countries of the world, historically, for thousands of years since Christ, if you said you're a Christian, you're going to pay the price for being a Christian, and it might include martyrdom. And that doesn't sound like much encouragement, but he says there's encouragement to be had in Christ. Um, I would think this morning, June, who was feeling probably a little down, um, probably spending a night in the hospital wasn't her cup of tea either, would be my guess. It'd be tough to hold that woman down anywhere, but to be in pain, to knock the socks off you in a big, big hurry. And it doesn't take long. So I would think her focus would be not just on her predicament and anyone who's ever been ill, whether you have a bad cough and congested lungs or uh, you name it, we all had any number of different ailments. Our focus isn't necessarily on our ailment, but on Christ. The benefit, the encouragement of being united with Christ, that he is our brother and our friend, He's our healer. He's our encourager. But anyway, as he goes on, he says, let's take a look at him. Encouragement. Could you amplify that a little bit? How are you encouraged by being in Christ, being with Christ? How does that happen in the challenges and the very positive experiences? What encouragement do you have by being with Christ? Well, I had the encouragement of eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, so that's pretty positive encouragement. You can't top that one, Donna. Thank you. So, yeah, Dale? No matter what happens, he's there. He's there, always there. But when those whatevers happen, is he the first one we turn to? I hope so. Sometimes that might be a bit of a challenge. Uh, yeah. Any other encouragements you might get from being with Christ? Eh? I have the answers to the questions that the rest of mankind is searching for. Amen. Who am I? Why am I here? All those yeah. questions, you know. 
And then propose the greater mysteries that we talked about before, as Paul says. Why me? Why me, God? Why do you love me? But he does. And I'm positive of that. Anything else? Other encouragements? Just a, just a peacefulness all the time. There should be a peace that passes all understanding. Um, I'm, yeah. Well, Diane is next. Faith in him. Faith in him. As opposed to almost anything else under the earth, uh, he's the one steady rock. Tim? Mm -hmm. The other uh, thing is that is, I, think I told you on, on the phone in the early part of uh, the week, uh, the early part of last week, is the, the scripture that I've uh, uh, that you and I talked about a couple of times, and that is you know, where Paul uh, said in Philippians, you know, Philippians chapter 4, where, where, where he said, be anxious for nothing. You know, be anxious for nothing. This is what he's been doing this every day. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through supplication, with prayer, thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. And the peace that path all the pass of all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I read that every day. In our culture, depending on who we are and where we are, that's the kind of verse you do have to read about 40 times a day. Right. You know, because uh, it's easy to get wrapped up in our work, our neighborhood, our own personal lives. It's easy to become distracted and take our eyes off Christ. But it seems like uh, rest and peace um, is an element that we have that a lot of other people may never ever possess. There are all so many people uptight, nervous, stressed. We're also Yes, yes, we're not alone. Thank you. So that even though uh, Pastor and Joan aren't here, we're, they're still our brother and sister. We're still mindful of them. They're part of our fellowship, um, as is June and Marlowe and others. And it's like, you no, know, you just don't disconnect that connection. You can't do that because why? That's an eternal connection. It's a God-made human connection so that we support each other that way. are mindful of each other. Anything else? I'm not trying to make an exhaustive list. I just wanted to get you involved a little bit here this morning. Okay. I think it would be cool if you would do this on your own. Um, these ifs like this first one, we kind of amplified that first one and said, what kind of encouragement do we have from being united with Christ? We listed a bunch, and there's probably a whole long list more. I'd encourage you in your quiet time, your study, go through and make a list of your own. The encouragement I get from being with Christ is in fellowship knowing the answers to the great mysteries of life, having hope, having peace, having access to prayer, having a calmness, a surety. I mean, you could make a long list. Now let's look at the next one. He said, if you have any comfort from Christ's love, he's building toward a case in just a moment. If you have any comfort from his love, what kind of comfort do you get from his love? We're just going to do each one of these briefly because I think this other gems. It, 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 it itemizes the richness we have, the wealth we have in Christ beyond description. Well, I would just say, uh, uh, first of all, that uh, agape love, that love that, that, that the love that, we, that, we, that only God can love us with. You know, love that is not like the world's love. Mm -hmm. um, and that his love is sometimes we lose time about that, but I think that his love is unconditional. And that's something that is, you know, unlike the world, that, that is uh, exclusive with God's love, is that it's unconditional in that he knows everything we've ever thought, everything we've ever said, everything we've ever done. God knows every little last thing about you. There's not one thing about you he does not know. After president, he says, I love you anyway. You know, we're and he loves us anyway because the blood of Christ covers all those sins. That's the important part. Um, he 
doesn't see those sins because we're washed white as snow. And uh, that is an extravagance of love beyond our comprehension, isn't it? We have comfort that he doesn't see my sins because Christ is washed me white as snow by the sacrifice of his blood. That's love. What does scripture say? That God loved us, Christ loved us while we were yet his enemies. How can that be? That he was willing to lay down his life even though we were his enemies. That's astonishing. Who would do that? Who would do that? A man will give up, uh, how likely is it that a man would give up his life for his friend, much less his enemies? It's astonishing. This, these, these conditional things are only reminders of the treasure we have in Christ. And boy, I tell you, if you read this and you just skim by it, you, I think you miss a little bit of, of what Paul is really <coughs> wanting to do for the Philippians and for us by reminding them that we have something quite remarkable. Uh, Tim talked about the word agape love, and that's truly an unparalleled, unconditional love of God, but that's the kind of love that we ought to be imitating at some level or striving for. How that works in a human condition is it something altogether more difficult, however, isn't it? Trying to love someone unconditionally. I'll tell you what, I think that's the biggest challenge there is. You know, we see their faults, their positive qualities and their faults, but also operating within our own faults and flaws and sins. So it makes it very difficult for that to happen. But can it be done? Oh yes, it can. I'm thinking of uh, Nate Saint and Jim Elliott. Uh, those are reasonably familiar names to you. Everybody know them? They uh, uh, were young men. You know Elizabeth Elliott, the writer? I'm like, oh my goodness, you have to go get those books. You really must. Uh, Jim Elliott and Nate Saint were young men at Wigan College back in the late 40s. And they were um, compelled by God to become uh, missionaries. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Barbara, I'm sure. But uh, they became uh, missionaries in aviators. Details were there, but they had this little tiny Piper Cub, and they were assigned to go reach this native Indian tribe way down somewhere in the jungles. I don't even remember what country now, but it was the Aka Indians. And uh, they found. Do you remember this, Leslie? You know the story, I'm sure you do. And they. Uh, they uh, strove very hard to find a place where they could even land this little airplane in the middle of the jungle, and they ended up uh, on what amounted to a beach or a sandbar in the jungle. And when they got out, they were greeted by the Aka Indians, and the Aka Indians killed them both. <laughs> uh, they knew before they ever even put their minds to it, that those native Indians were bloodthirsty, cannibalistic, uh, hostile group, and they still charged right in. Why would they do that? Because of an imitation of agape love, that while those guys were still their enemies, they were willing to lay their lives down, potentially. I mean, I grew up uh, in, the, uh, in the beginning of the 60s reading uh, those books by Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, some of them uh, those written, of course, telling their story and thinking, wow, I could never be like that. I could never do that. And then his wife went back. Yeah, and then Lizzie, yeah. And, Elizabeth and eventually those, those Aka Indians uh, became redeemed, which is astonishing. No, his wife is, I, I'm not sure whether she's still alive. Do you know? Yes. She? Anyway, uh, I used Elizabeth Elliot's book, Passion and Purity, 
on campus for many, many years uh, because her courtship with her husband, Jim, was on again and off again, and the reason it was is because Jim Elliott had a job placed ahead of him by God, and it was difficult to, to get him redirected to her, but she was in love, and she tells it's a wonderful, wonderful book for a young woman. I haven't found a better book for young people, men and women, than Elizabeth Elliott's Passion and Purity. It's about how they maintain the appropriate perspective and behavior in their emerging relationship considering God was king. And that was a struggle. I mean, she was very uh, frank about that in that book. If any of you, I don't have, I think I, I don't know how many I gave, but I don't have to away scores of them. Um, she died in 2015. She did, I thought so, thank you. But uh, she, she was a very popular speaker and a very insightful woman. And, um, but anyway, uh, any comfort from his love? That doesn't sound like you take much comfort from God's love if he sends you to a jungle where Indians are going to kill you. But they count it all joy. Not to die in you know, such a brutal fashion, but the fact that they could serve God. That they could share God and take every human risk imaginable in order to accomplish that. I mean, that's powerful. When you think about our comfort, we were talking about the encouragement we have with Christ. We think about our comfort, we're pretty safe. We might be apprehensive about some of the new neighbors that have moved in next to you or down the street. Uh, they don't speak the same language, they don't have the same habits, they don't do this, that. We are nervous about other things, but these people put themselves into the way of danger in order to preach the gospel. If any tenderness and compassion. Now, ladies, I assume that you're a little bit more tender and compassionate than most men. It's just, I think, in your nature. Um, Eric and I have these uh, peripheral conversations from time to time about this couple or that couple who show up here for a little while, they get our food pantry, they you run to the grocery store with them, you do this or that, and then they disappear because they've gotten what they've needed. And I'm like, well, that's what we do as a church. We reach out, like, people come, that's what we do. And Eric is a little bit more manly about this. <laughs> and he says, well, I know how they can fix their situation. And I said, how's that? He can go get a job. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Eric. I don't dispute that. Um, but Eric, in his heart, whatever, you know, he's such a gracious giver, man, you know, you can't take that away from him. But when he says, if you have any tenderness and then any compassion, and there's a then coming in just a moment. But he says, if those first several things haven't apprehended you, if you haven't been encouraged by Christ, if you haven't had any fellowship or comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, if none of that has affected you profoundly, then the next phrase then, make my joy complete, will have little effect. It's not about Paul, it's about enjoying the presence and walk with Christ. And if you don't, something skewered somewhere. I find it very easy when, for example, there is this little girl, Aubrey, uh, who comes on Wednesday night with Shirley and from Monday. Well, I think she's... Huh? Yeah, but Grandma, I think she is just God luck, beautiful, wonderful, precious, and I just think she's the most adorable little girl there ever was I could ever lay eyes on. And she's a little shy and quiet, but the other night she came out to play basketball after our pizza, and she came and, and 
and Gracie came out too, and then there were a couple other girls, but, but Aubrey came out. I said, Aubrey, do you want to shoot the basketball? Well, I just wanted to grab her right up, you know, and uh, I said, well, the boys, boys are very good. I'm telling you, these boys that we have are by and large extraordinary. I just think they're the most wonderful boys, and you can tell they come, so many of them come from godly homes. It's easy to see their discipline, their calm, their respectful, their wonderful. So I said, we got to the end, and I said to the boys, okay, Aubrey's going to shoot the basketball. Well, of course, the basketball is pretty near bigger than she is. <laughs> and she tries it, and she tries it, and she tries it, and by golly, she makes it. And everybody cheers for, you know, and we did this with Gracie the other night. And it was just, it's, it's like I have a certain warmth in my heart for little kids that just seem so precious to me. Now, maybe they're at home, and they probably are from time to time. Um, but I, can, I have the biggest heart for our kids when it comes to something like that. I don't really know how to interact with them too good, but I just think they're precious. I think that's great. Now I have a whole lot more trouble having tenderness and compassion with some of our children who are a little less disciplined. And um, I want to grab by the arm and sit them down and yell in their face because they're being rude, disrespectful, wild, and they don't listen. You know what you're, you're talking about. They're to teach them because they don't Yeah, and I'm thinking, Thank you, Donna, for reminding me. <laughs> I said, I said to one of the grandparents who brought them, I said, I feel like I need to take him out behind the fence and give him a good whooping. But uh, I didn't. But uh, I was, I, I had a little less tenderness and compassion for deliberately disobedient young people, but these little kids, uh, and by and large, all of them, all, God has sent all of them to us, and we're just glad to have the chance. And there's something not only for them to learn, but as God reminds me, something for me to learn, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I go from tenderness and compassion to, like, <clears throat> quickly, you know, but then there's this then, and we're out of time, and we need to look at that next week. He says, then make my joy complete. I'd like you to look at this. It's by being like-minded. I want you to have the same attitude as I do, the same understanding of truth that I do, so you can enjoy the fullness of God's presence in your life. And it's a plea. It's a plea and the premise that if you have this relationship of surety, of assurance with Christ, then you're going to receive benefits that can't necessarily all be listed on a piece of paper because they're endless benefits. And we lose track of them. He says, because we need to be humble and God conscious. And that's basically the theme of the next seven or eight verses. This business of humility. And he says it in verse 3. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. You know how hard that is to do with some people? <laughs> really. And other people, it's so easy. It's a good thing God is not a respecter of persons. Anyway, I think it's a. I think if if there is, if I had the capacity and the discipline to memorize passages, this would be the passage that I would want to take with me. I know it in part, but not in whole, only because Paul says, "Straighten up. If you're going to be a Christian, this is the way to go. This is the way to go. It's not about you. It's about God. And it requires people who are humble." So next week we'll take a look at this notion of humility, and uh, I thought we'd get a little farther, but this, it's so packed I can't get very far. It's just packed. It's like opening up from week to week for me a treasure chest, and, and as soon as you open it, there's gold bullion and coins 
just pouring out of the thing, and I get overwhelmed. But anyway, I hope you'll forgive me for that. Anyway, would you please take a look at uh, this passage again for next week? Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I think you'll be blessed. The more you dwell on it, the more you will be blessed by it. Let's pray. Father, good morning, Alice. Father, we thank you. We are again mindful um, how much you love us. And, and your Tim reminded us agape, unconditional, perfect love. Why me that you would love me so, as Paul says? But you do. That is a mystery we can't explain. But we do know the mystery of our purpose, and that is to serve and love you, and there's no mystery to it. We are given to encourage one another, to be tender and compassionate, to be one in the spirit, to have fellowship with one another. That's who you made us to be. And I pray, Father, your blessing on us, even as we continue in your word and continue on in worship this morning. Pray that you would also once again minister to June and Marlo and, and Pastor Phillips and Joan as they travel, uh, that their time might be blessed and joy-filled. I pray these things in Christ's name.